So today we're going to start talking about measurement. And measurement is one of those topics that we're all familiar with, but it helps to have a little bit of a look at the history. Measurement came, came about as a need to communicate, one, and two, to keep records. Um, for example, it's easiest to talk about length measurement to start. If, if two people are trying to build two, uh, things that are identical to each other, if they're in the same room, it's not a big deal. One, one can just walk over to the other and hold the pieces side by side and mark them off. Um, but if they're not in the same room, let's say they're across town or down the hall even, they need some way to communicate that. So let's say this piece of paper is the size of what we want that piece to be, and I need to communicate that to you. I might take my pen and hold it up to the paper and say, okay, one, two, okay, the paper is just a little bit more than two pens long. I might say two and a quarter pens long. So then you get, I send that measurement to you, it's two and a quarter pens. You take your pen, and you'll notice if you go two and a quarter, well, there's two Two and a quarter is going to be up here. You end up with something way longer. For measurement to be effective, two things have to occur. First, both, both people must have one of those objects that we're using to measure. But, more importantly, they must be the same size. Here, the two pens we had were very different sizes. The red one is quite a bit longer than the blue one. So, if we're using those as a comparison one of us is going to be way off. Other thing measurement was needed for was to keep records. Let's say I'm going to build this thing today, but I want to be able to come back in a year and build another one just like it, but maybe not have that one sitting there to copy. Measurement allows us to keep records and come back and repeat that process later. So, Notice the pens didn't work because they're different lengths. From, like I said, measurement could only work if both people had that object. So they resorted to things that most people had, almost everybody had, to be honest. And for length measurement, and we're going to start talking about customary length measurement. Custom areas are old system. Um, old system, which was the, the units put together. Custom areas, sometimes called standard length, um, came from parts of the body. Our smallest unit of length that we use is an inch. And that was from the tip of the thumb to the point of that first knuckle. So I could measure my piece of paper, one, two, three, four, five. Notice that motion, by the way, the rocking of my thumb as I went up there. Um, that's where the inch horn got its name, is because of that rocking motion when it walked. Bigger than an inch, we have a foot. One foot we know of as containing 12 inches. A foot is exactly what you'd think, the length from the back of your heel to the tip of your longest toe. Now, foot has a little bit more variation. Thumbs from one person to another, um, pretty standard. Um, foot's feet have quite a bit different lengths from one person to another. Because of that issue in the 500s, King Edward declared that his thumb and his foot and his everything else were going to be the official measuring units of the land. That declaration, even though it was a very egotistic move on King Edward's part, played a big role in the development of measurement. One of the, so what happened is craftsmen came in, they King Edward's thumb and they marked it off on something. They took his foot and marked it off and everything else. And they went and they cut blocks of, of whatever material they used and passed it out for people to use. So what it did now, instead of having to take my thumb and move it up the paper, I had that little block I could use. In fact, it even allowed us to go that next step. Is that, well, since we've got the standard little block, we can just take a stick and mark off the block on the stick. That was the first ruler. A um, ruler came coming from King Edward, the ruler. Um, we were using 
the ruler's dimensions to create that. So we didn't have to count anymore. And you'll notice if you tried to just move your thumb like this, every time you move it, there was a little error put in because you don't necessarily get your knuckle exactly where the tip of the thumb was before. So his declaration of, of, of having those standard measurements took a lot of the error out of our measurements by allowing us to create that ruler, that measuring device. His King Edward's declaration also removed the need for a lot of units. There are several units that exist that we're not going to discuss today because they don't get used anymore. For example, if I wanted to measure the height of this wall behind me, I wouldn't use inches. I wouldn't want to sit there with my thumb and stack them up and count that whole wall. There'd be a lot of inches there. It'd be hard to keep track. We would probably use feet. However, if I'm using my foot, I can maybe get up to here with some serious stretching, but I'm not getting all the way up to the ceiling unless I chop my foot off. Feet were used to measure items along the ground because that's where feet are. If I wanted to measure a height like that wall, we had a unit that was easier to go up and down, the hand. The hand was the width of the hand at the base of the fingers. Stack them up like this to measure heights. Um, to this day, if you're into livestock, if you're horses, uh, cows, sheep, uh, the height of, of those is still measured in hands traditionally. Going bigger than a foot, we have a yard. The yard, of course, we all know of as three feet. Many people think of the yard as being the length of a stride, um, and that is about a yard, but that's not where it came from. The yard actually comes from either the center of your chest or the tip of your nose, the end of your outstretched hand. If you ever bought fabric, um, you might have someone grab the fabric and they go one, two, they're measuring out yards. I mean, it was a tailor's unit. Now, King Edward did not have three of his feet in his yard or 12 of his inches in his foot. There was no conversion between them. Each of them, each measurement, inches, feet, yards, had its own specific purpose it was used for. They were never intended. There, there was a need, but they developed a unit for that need, and there was there was no intention to ever use those units with each other. I mean, it was uh, hundreds of years later after King Edward's death that they adjusted those links to make them fit together so that they could be used. Bigger than the yard, actually smaller than the yard, there's the, the cubit that we don't use anymore. And that was in construction. It was from the tip of your fingers to the point of your elbow. That was about 16 inches. Um, if you're familiar with construction at all, all of your spacing in construction is 16 inches apart. At least in traditional construction, now with, with um, heavier structural members, it's gone to two feet instead of 16 inches. Traditional construction was that one cubit spacing, or 16 inches. Bigger than a yard, we had things like a fathom, which was six feet. That was the shallowest water that most major vessels, ships, could navigate through without touching bottom. A rod. Actually, a rod is still used quite a bit in land surveying, but we're not going to be concerned about it in this course. We'll jump up to a mile, which was 5,280 feet, or 1,760 yards. And the mile was actually came from the, the Greek and Roman military. Milli, mil is the Greek prefix for a thousand. It was the distance that a Greek or Roman soldier would march a thousand paces in formation. A pace was starting on your left foot, going to your right, and back to your left foot. Well, in medicine, links are really only important in orthopedics. Links are not really the main type of measurement that's important. But getting into our other types of measurement, First, we need to discuss the difference between weight and mass. Still looking at that customary or standard measurement, weight is the force of gravity on an object. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. An 
object, the matter can be thought of as like your particles and material, the amount of material in the object, the amount of stuff that's in the object. Big difference is how they're measured. Now, a spring is actually a very precise measurement of force to distance. If I have a spring that's mounted on a surface like this, and when there's zero force on it, at this certain length. I'll put zero half gear. If I put a force on it and stretch it out, distance that it is from its original spot, we'll call that just, we'll call it D for distance for now. That is one unit of force that stretched it out. If we double that unit of force, double that force, Two units of force, or double whatever that first force was. The distance that spring stretched is now double the distance. So the, the force applied, or the distance the spring stretches, is exactly proportional, very precisely proportional to the force applied. So a spring is a very good, at least a good spring, is a very good measurement of force. So how does that come into gravity? Well, when we measure gravity, Take that spring and we put it on a casing that's going to hold it. And then on that casing, or on the spring itself, we mount an indicator. And in the casing, we have markings, a scale set up so that we can see how far the spring is stretched and relate that to the force. That's why this is called a scale. Because there are scale markings on that indicator, on that casing. So when I put the object on there, it stretches and the indicator moves, and we can read off, based on how far it moves, we can read off what the force is to get the weight or the force of gravity. Mass, on the other hand, is measured with what's called a balance. A balance is almost like a seesaw or teeter-totter, very precise um, teeter-totter. If I take my object I'm trying to measure and I put it on one side, then I put known masses on the other side. When it balances, whatever this known mass is, that's the mass of the object we're trying to measure. Well, what's the big deal? What's the difference? I mean, the more mass it has, the more weight it has, the, seem to, the two seem to be very, very closely related. And they are. The difference is mass not depend on gravity. What, what does that mean? Well, you may have heard um, stories about how on the moon, Gravity is one-sixth of the gravity on Earth, and that is true on the right side of the moon. So if we took this object to the moon and we used a scale, well, gravity is going to pull one-sixth the amount as it did on Earth. So the weight is going to be one-sixth of what it was on Earth. With the balance, however, gravity will pull less on the object, but it's also going to pull less on the known mass. So the same known mass will still balance that object. So the mass is not dependent on gravity. Now on Earth, gravity is pretty constant. Um, there's less than an 8% difference between the North Pole and the South Pole, um, as far as, or between the North Pole and the equator, I should say, as far as uh, variations in the amount of gravity. Now that does mean in a 200 pound person, um, there would be like 12 or 13 pounds difference in weight. Um, between the North Pole and the equator. It's close enough. It's small enough, though, that we don't worry about it too much. So on Earth, we tend to blur the lines between mass and weight. There is a standard unit of mass. I'm going to throw that out there because we don't use mass very often in the standard system or the customary system. It is called a slug. Um, 
it's a term you may have heard. You may have heard someone say there's a whole slug of them over there. That's what they're referring to is actually that unit of mass called a slug. Um, a slug is about 32 pounds, so it is a relatively large unit. Well, we are going to focus on standard weight because the standard system tends to focus on weight. In the standard system, our large unit of weight is the ton. A ton is 2,000 pounds. Now, there are other variations of a ton. There's a long ton or a gross ton. Uh, it's a little bit larger, but 99.999% of the time, you hear the word ton, talking 2,000 pounds. Now, in the medical fields, hopefully we don't deal with a ton too often. So let's look at things smaller than a pound. First, let's talk about that abbreviation for a pound. Um, weight was originally used for buying and selling grain. It would make sense to abbreviate pound as PD, but unfortunately in the bookkeeping system for buying and selling grain, PD was already used for the abbreviation for paid. So for pounds, what they did is they used the Latin word for pound, which is Libra. That's where the LB comes from for the abbreviation for pound. Smaller than a pound, one pound is 16 ounces. Now to stay consistent, since they use the Latin word libra for the abbreviation for pound, they use the Latin word ounza as the abbreviation for ounce. The ounce is abbreviated OZ. There's a unit smaller than an ounce that many of us are not familiar with. In fact, many of us think it's part of the met many people think it's part of the metric system because it sounds metric, but it is not. It is called a dram. A dram is part of the standard system. It is 16 drams equals one ounce. It is one of the original apothecary units. Um, you might be prescribed an eighth of a dram of a medication or a quarter of a dram of a medication. There are units smaller yet. Um, we have a grain. The grain typically goes back to a pound. One pound was 7,000 grain. I'm going to list here the abbreviation for a dram is DR. For grains is GR. For most standard units, we use a two letter abbreviation. Be careful, it's real easy to confuse grains with grams. Grams will be a metric unit, it's just going to be G. As we get larger, go into other areas, by the way, grains um, was used for a lot of things. If you're familiar with guns, you hear you know, a 150 grain um, bullet that's talking about the amount of powder or whatever in there or the size of the projectile itself. Um, in the medical fields, it was one of the most precise ways of measuring medications. Grains actually referred to grains of sand. It took 7,000 grains of sand for one pound. Imagine being the first person sitting there with the tweezers and counting out grains of sand to make a pound. Um, they didn't do that very often. They actually had little, like, little thimbles, little cups that were 50, 100, and whatever grains that they used to measure things out. Next, we want to talk about capacity. Similar to the weight and mass issue, we need to talk about the difference between capacity and volume. Volume calculated from length. We have a box. That is 14 inches by 9 inches by 8 inches. Volume of that is just multiplying those length dimensions together. 14 inches times 9 inches times 8 inches, giving us, my fingers are starting to touch over here, 1,008 cubic inches. 
Our units for volume are always going to be a length unit cube, cubic inches, cubic feet, cubic yards. Capacity, on the other hand, was standard sized containers. Start out with a gallon. Gallon originally was actually the amount that you could hold in a standard men's hat. Now I'm not talking about a cowboy hat or a baseball cap. Now, this was like the standard European style dress, like derby style hat. It was a gallon. Smaller than a gallon, you have a quart. Now a quart is actually short for a quarter gallon, so there's four quarts in a gallon. Um, so the quart was directly found off of the gallon. Um, both a gallon and a quart could be used for both liquid or dry measurement. The next one down, one quart holds pints. A pint, it was liquid measurement and it was just a standard sized jar. Um, that was used for storing or preserving food or for serving beverages. It was a standard size. Um, now, since those jars were already produced and made, uh, they didn't want to change the size of the pint. But a quart did not hold quite two pints. So they adjusted the quart to hold two pints, which meant the gallon had to get adjusted. So the gallon that we use today is actually quite a bit larger than the traditional gallon. Smaller than a pint, you have cups. There are two cups in a pint. A cup was actually dry measurement. A cup was the amount of powder you could hold in your cupped hand. If you're cooking, it would be sugar or flour. You would dump in there, heap it up, and that what would be held in your hand was a cup. One cup holds eight good ounces. A fluid ounce was literally the size or the, the volume of one ounce of water. Smaller than a fluid ounce, you have the tablespoon. There are two tablespoons in a fluid ounce or 16 tablespoons in a cup, if you want to go directly there. Um, the tablespoon was just the large spoon that was typically used for eating um, at the table. The tablespoon then contains three teaspoons. The teaspoon was a small spoon that was used to put sugar into tea. We have units that are smaller than those. Um, dash, the smidgen, the pinch, um, but there's actually, those aren't really important, those are used for cooking, but not really for apothecary or medical use. The one that we do use is the drop. There are 60 drops in one teaspoon. Now there are a lot, like I said, there are a lot of other units out there. Um, we have minims. 60 minims on fluid dram. Obviously, the fluid dram is smaller than the fluid ounce, has a direct relationship. Unfortunately, the fluid dram is not, there's not 16 fluid drams in a fluid ounce. That is not the same as for the weight conversion. So we tend not to use minims or fluid drams. Any more in our medical conversions because of that. So let's talk now about the metric system. First, let's compare it to the standard system, or customary system. That customary system, as we said, is what's called an evolved system. There was a need, we developed something to fit that need, and then we used it. There was a different need, we developed something different to fit that need, and we used it. 
Much later, we took all those different things that we developed and we put them together to make a measuring system. They were never meant to work together. At one point, if I measured something in inches and you measured something else in feet, there was no way to compare to see which one was bigger or smaller. One of us was going to have to go back and remeasure in the other unit. There was no relationship between feet and inches because those units were never intended to, to work together. Each unit had its own very specific use. There was no system, there was no intended relationship between them. So evolved system sounds like a, a good thing, but it really wasn't. Um, we had to force all these units that were developed independently to work together, and that's why we had those weird conversions, like three feet in a yard, or 16 ounces in a pound. They were forced, basically. So the metric system was a planned system. It literally been using standard or customary measurement for thousands of years. Knew what worked well, knew what didn't. So the purpose of the metric system was to build on those things that worked well and get rid of the things that didn't. So what they did is they used only one unit each type of measurement. length, that unit was a meter. So a meter, this thing right here is one meter long. One of the problems with a meter is if I want to relate it to our customary units, a yard would end right about there. That is a yard, a meter is out here. It's just under three and a half inches longer. The meter is about three and a half inches longer than a yard. And I can remember when I was young and I was first learning the metric system, it bothered me. Why didn't they just make the meter equal to the yard? Well, they had thought of that too. The metric system was developed in Switzerland in the 1880s. Meter is actually equal to the Swiss yard. Remember I said King Edward declared his foot, and his thumb, and everything else to be the official measurements? He was not the only ruler, a leader, who did that. Other leaders in different areas made the same declaration. So from one area to the next, the standard system was not standard. It could be very different. Switzerland, their yard was a little bit longer, and that's what they based the meter on. You might ask, well, why didn't they use the U.S. yard? Well, in 1880, the U.S. was definitely not a world power. The, the U.S. did not become a world power. It started in the 19-teens, but it really came to in World War II in the 1940s. Um, so in the 1880s, the United States was not a major consideration in these types of decisions. So the Swiss yard became our meter. For... Mass and weight. Our standard system tended to, tends to focus on weight. The metric system tends to focus on mass. Weight, there is a unit of weight in the metric system. It is called a newton. Outside of chemistry and physics, you don't hear a newton used very often. For mass, the unit is gram. For capacity, it used is a liter. Now, as we go through this, I will show you there's actually a link between each of these. So the conversion from one to the other can be done rather easily. Like up here, capacity and volume really kind of measure the same thing. However, if I want to look at a gallon compared to cubic inches, one gallon is 231 cubic inches. Four cubic feet, one cubic foot, is like 7.48 gallons. There's not a great translation from 
capacity to volume in our standard system. The metric system, however, they planned that out. They made sure there was a direct translation. Now, we only have one main unit for each type of measurement. We're not going to use the Newton. We're just going to use the meter, the gram, and the liter. Meter is abbreviated M, gram is abbreviated G, liter abbreviated L. Now, I was always taught to abbreviate the L, the liter with a capital L. Um, that's just so you don't confuse it with ones. So it is okay to use a small L, but I'll use a capital L just because to avoid that confusion. That is the main unit. As we went smaller, we had the abbreviation deci. Deci meant one tenth. So a decimeter or a decigram or a deciliter was a tenth of a meter or a tenth of a gram or a tenth of a liter. We had the prefix centi. Now cent is 100. Centi is one one hundredth. So a centimeter or centigram or centiliter is one hundredth of the original unit. Milli was the next prefix. Again, we mentioned that mil meant a thousand. Milli was one one thousand. So millimeter, milligram, or milliliter was a thousandth of the main unit. Now we didn't go every ten after that. They skipped ten thousand and hundred thousand. They went to a millionth. That prefix was micro. Now, M was already in use for milligrams, so for micro, the abbreviation they used was the Greek letter mu. It looked like that kind of funny looking mu with a tail or a P with an open top. So a micrometer, microgram, or microliter. Those are the scientific abbreviations. However, in the medical field, the medical field is one of the first fields that had to keyboard everything into a computer system. There is no mu key on a computer keyboard. So to make it faster, the medical fields created their own abbreviation for micro basically. MCM was a micrometer, MCG was a microgram, and MCL was a microliter. Sounds very small to be a millionth of a unit, but it actually is used quite a bit in the medical fields. Even smaller yet would be nano, which would be a billionth. And that's getting down to the size of a single atom. So it's getting a little small. Um, but you do hear about nanotechnology or nano MERS, nano medications. Um, it's going to be something at some point once our, as our technology improves that we're going to hear a lot of in medicine. Going larger than the standard unit, deca. The prefix deca meant 10. Now, DM was already used for decimeter, so it was DAM for decameter, AG for decagram, or DAL for decaliter. Hecto was 100. So hectometer is 100 meters, hectogram or hectoliter was 100 of those units. Kilo meant 1,000. Kilometer was 1,000 meters, kilogram, 1,000 grams. Kiloliter, a thousand liters. Once again, we skipped ten thousand and a hundred thousand. We went straight to a million. A million was mega. Notice we abbreviate that with a capital M. Capital M, little M is a mega meter. Capital M, little G is a mega gram, and ML is a mega liter. Now, you probably have never seen a hectometer or a hectogram or even a decaliter. Well, for the most part, what gets used is the main unit. Kilo for most of them. Kiloliter doesn't get used very often. Milli for, for the most part. Of course, micro gets used. Mega gets used for, for many of them. The other units don't get used much at all. Centimeter gets used a lot in the United States because the inch is so ingrained in our culture, and the centimeter is the closest thing to an inch of length. But in other areas, that doesn't get used much. The deciliter gets used in medicine. All of our blood and 
all of our bodily fluid tests, blood, urine, whatever, um, are per deciliter. Like if you get your, your blood sugar test and you get tested at 92, that is 92 milligrams of blood glucose per deciliter of blood. So that does come up in the medical fields. Now I promised there was a connection here. One milliliter is defined to be one cubic centimeter. So one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So there's that direct link or direct link between our lengths, our volumes, and our capacities. Next, one gram was defined to be the mass of one milliliter of water. So again, there is a direct link between our mass and our capacities. This, by the way, is very important in the next unit. One gram is equivalent to one milliliter. Now we start looking at medications, and constituting medications. Let's talk about conversions. With our standard units, our conversions became a little tricky because we had all these different numbers out there to remember. If I had 3.5 fluid ounces, and I want to, or not fluid ounces, just 3.5 regular ounces, I won't go fluid ounces, let's go regular ounces. And I want to convert that to drams. Now I purposely chose those units because we're not as familiar with them. If I chose feet and inches, you could probably make that conversion in your head right away. But 3.5 ounces is not to drams is not a conversion we make very often. What we use is something called dimensional analysis. What dimensional analysis does allows us to use the units themselves to make the conversion. Any equivalency can be used to make a conversion. Here we know that one ounce equals grams. That equivalency will make our conversion for us. So here I'm going to take my 3.5 ounces, I put it over one to make it a fraction. And then here I'm going to use a unity fraction or a conversion factor to change it. I'm getting rid of ounces, so I'm going to put ounces on bottom so that when I multiply, those can cross cancel. One ounce equals 16 drams. Now when I look at this, it doesn't look like it at first, but that equals one. That was just like when we had our regular fractions and I had three-fourths, and I multiplied by five on top and bottom to get 15 twentieths. This five over five that I multiplied by equaled one. It was a unity fraction. It changed the appearance, but not the value. Well, this is also a unity fraction. It equals one, because 16 drams and one ounce are the same thing. It won't change the value, it'll just change the appearance of our measurement. So now the ounces cross cancel out in our fraction multiple. Now we have 3.5 times 16 drams, six drams, one times one is one, so 56 grams over one is just 56 grams. Uh, we might have another measurement that we're lesser familiar with. Going from metric to standard, if I tell you that one kilogram <coughs> is equivalent to about 2.2 pounds, and I have a patient that comes in weighing 189 pounds, and I need to convert that into kilograms. Now again, this is not a conversion that we make on a regular basis, at least not yet. Now, if you're in the medical field, you'd make this conversion a lot. We'll take the 189 pounds, we'll put it over one, and then for a conversion factor, multiplying by this fraction, we have to put pounds on bottom so they'll cancel out. 2.2 pounds equals one kilogram. Pounds cancel out. On top, 189 times 1 kilogram is 189 kilograms. On bottom, 
1 times 2.2 .2 is 2.2. .2. Then we have to divide that out. 189 divided by 2.2 .2 is 85.91 kilograms. So somebody who weighs 189 pounds is 85.91 kilograms. In your book, this dimensional analysis is an extremely powerful tool. Um, it's going to be used in a lot of our dosage calculations and units. We're going to spend a couple of weeks doing dimensional analysis problems, analysis problems for our dosage calculations, to be honest. Uh, it's a huge tool. The book gets a little carried away with it. Um, you know, if you have something like milliliters per minute, and you multiply that by um, ETT is the abbreviation for drops, per milliliter, what's going to happen is the milliliters cancel out and you have on top you just have the drops, on bottom you have the minutes. So you get drops per minute. That is a very practical application of dimensional analysis. Your textbook, however, gets into some really weird stuff where they have like a meter to the power of negative one. Well, anytime you have something to the power of negative Recording one, is on. times that made that main unit, so milliliters to the, or millimeters to the negative one times meters to the power of negative one times meters, that just equals one. Because think of this as meters to the power of positive one, and when we multiply things with the same base, we add powers. Well, negative one plus one is zero. That would be meters to the power of zero, and anything to the power of zero is just one. So your textbook gets a little carried away with those types of conversions. They actually come up with things like this. Uh, we have a meter times a gram squared over a liter to the power of negative one, meter to the power of negative one, times a liter to the power of negative one over meter times meter squared times a gram. Well, as we're looking at this, again, this is ludicrous. There is no real calculation as units like this. But the first thing I would do here is anything that's squared, like grams squared, I would break that up. So this is going to be meters times grams times grams. Meters to the negative one times meters to the negative. Over here, liters to the negative one. Meters squared will be meters times meters, and then times grams. Then we can cancel out. First of all, we can cross cancel anything. We have liters to the negative one and liters to the negative one will cancel those. Meters and meters are crossed, so we can cancel those. A gram and another gram can be canceled. As we multiply here, we have grams times nothing, so there's grams on top. On bottom, meters to the negative one times meters, that's just one. So it's grams over one or just grams. Now, like I said, this is getting a little carried away with the units of the dimensional analysis. But it's good practice to get good at canceling out those units to see what we end up with. It's, a, it's how we keep, make sure that we're doing the correct calculations in much of what we do. So with that, your homework out of the book, page 103, 1 through 19, the odd. Page 110, 1 through 41, the odd. And page 114, 1 through 25, the odd. Go over measurements. We'll talk more about measurements on Friday. Look at converting units of, of rates. Um, then next Monday is our unit two test. You guys have a great day. Hopefully we'll see you all on Friday.